Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and very good morning to all of you. So now in sexual reproduction, we have completed with the uh, sexual reproduction in um, animals and spatially in mammalians in detail with the sexual reproduction in human being. So now let us proceed with the rest of the chapter and it is the sexual reproduction in plants. Let's see how is it happening in plants. So let me share the screen with you all. So hope you all can see it. So what happens in sexual reproduction? So, you know, as uh, there are around 2,175,000 uh, 2, species of the plants, and uh, uh, there are a majority of them, most of them, with few exceptions, they all give rights to seeds. And we know that seeds are inside. If you look at the pomegranate or any fruit, there are now there are many hybrid fruits where we do not find seeds in them. But most of the fruits, 90% of 99%, I should say, do contain seeds. And these seeds are again used as uh, uh, for uh, uh, reproduction of the new plants. But let us see how are these seeds formed and how is sexual reproduction takes place in plants. Uh, then, you know, they, they are called as gymnosperms and angiosperms. Just say, go through and uh, find out, uh, do your own study and find out what are gymnosperms and what are angiosperms. And these, uh, most of the plants are flowering plants. And even we have discussed earlier that they are uh, either unisexual or bisexual. If the pollination is taking place if, if within the same plant then because of self-pollination and it could be a cross-pollination from one plant to other plants. So they, what all are the characteristics of these 275,000 species of the plants and how are they reproducing sexually? And if you look at the size of the trees, uh, they are ranging from very big trees, for example, take banyan trees and so. Uh, many of them, they are, their uh, sizes um, and weight could be in tons. And there are very tiny, small water plants or the rice grain plants. The size is also small and a very light in weight. So there are varieties available in the plants from uh, size, weight, and uh, you know uh, different varieties. And then you know if you look at this uh, sal growing in the Himalayan, this is a, a sal plant that grows in the Himalayan mountains. And uh, depending upon the conditions, as we see in the human being also races, we see that color, um, uh, different, uh, you know. Uh, features of a person, color of a person, person, I mean, uh, overall outer look differs from place to place. You see Africans, Asians, uh, different continents, um, you know, are having different type of appearances based upon the climatic conditions. So do the plants have, if you look at, and these plants have modified themselves according to their climatic conditions. Uh, these salt trees that are growing on Himalayan mountains are against, you know, cactus. You have seen the cactus that are grown in deserts, especially in Sahara deserts and the orchid plants on the branches of the jungle tree, they all are the flowering plants. We do have some non-flowering plants also. And, uh, and these sal trees that are growing in uh, Himalayan, uh, Himalayan are what you see here. These are the examples of all those uh, trees that you see. Yeah, this is sal tree. This is cactus against cactus. These are the seed, uh, I mean, the leaves are modified into spine like uh, in cactus, spine like structures. 
in order to uh, save water. And these are the orchid plants, which uh, flowers, which you can see here. Okay. So these are all flowering plants. Now let us see how this, what all are the reproductive parts. As you have seen in the, um, in human being, the rep we, we do have male and female reproductive uh, organs, as well as, you know, structures. So do we have in the flowers also. Like there you were having ovary and, uh, uh, you know, uh, testis and sperms and ovals were the reproductive that were uniting to form a zygote. So it have, uh, so is same in the flowers too. The flowers and the plants, the reproductive parts of the flowering plants are located inside the flowers. And uh, this is a common uh, datura plants uh, structure, which you see that. And below that, what all are the different, uh, uh, you know, parts of a flower? If you see below the flowers, uh, if you take a flower and see, there are green uh, structures, they are called sepals. And uh, you know, the flowers, uh, the flowers are surrounded and protected. These um, uh, organs are protected by a, uh, they are protected by means of a structure called, one sec, what has happened? So, So we see that the reproductive uh, parts of a flower are so well protected. And here you can see that uh, ovary inside, uh, ovary is here inside this flower. This is one of the female reproductive part of a flower. And we do have anthers, uh, stamens, anthers here. And uh, through this stigma, how is the pollen from the anthers? is transferred into the ovary. And then we do have carpels, this stigma, style, and ovary. This ovary, style, and stigma are called as the carpels. And these are the female reproductive parts. And then the anther and filaments are the stamens that you can take it as a uh, male reproductive part. And these all are the petals and sepals that are protecting, that are surrounding and protecting this reproductive parts in a flower. So these are the most important uh, uh, parts in a flower that helps in sexual reproduction and the growth of the uh, plants, how the reproduction, how are plants reproduced. Now, if you look at this, the reproductive parts of the flowers, which processes and flowers having either stamens or carpels are called unisexual, like that of the bottle garden papaya. In bottle garden papaya, you find only carpels. Carpels are that is stigma style ovary. Uh, that is only they have got the female reproductive for uh, we can take it as stigma style and ovary as a female reproductive part and anther filaments that is uh, called as the stamens as the male reproductive part. So there are certain plants that are unisexual that has got only carpels. So for example, bottle gourd and papaya is a very uh, good example of unisexual flowers. You can see this, this is the bottle gourd kaddu, which we eat as well as papaya. So here the flowers are having either stamens or carpels and are called unisexual. So they will either have the male reproductive or the female reproductive carpels or stamens are present, either one of them. So that is the reason they are called as unisexual. And uh, whereas the flowers which have got both 
stamens and carpels. As I think you all are very well, now you understood it very well. Stamen means anther and filament. Carpels means stigma, style and ovary. So if both are present in a flower, carpels are also present and stamens are also present. Then we call it as a bisexual flower. Sepals and petals had nothing to do with it. Okay. So uh, Datura is always given because Datura is a very easy plant where you can see this very clearly. And it's a bisexual flower and you have in detail about the uh, Datura plant. You can see the stamens produced in the, uh, please uh, have a look at it. Now you're coming to school. Please get a Datura flower or uh, we will get it and show it to you. Uh, Durga Mam will show it to you, uh, to you, all the parts of a flower. So once you see it, you'll be able to understand it properly well. So these stamens produce male sex cells in the pollen grains and carpels produce female sex cells in the ovules inside the ovaries. So now let us see what all are the different parts of carpels and stamens. Uh, if you can see that there is a passage, uh, as you have seen in stamens, you have got anthers and um, the, from the anthers, Anthers hold pollen powder into it, and that gets that pollen grains gets transferred through the stigma. And one of the passage of this com uh, compatible male sex cells called the style. And the part where the fusion of the male and female sex cells occur to form a zygote is called as the ovary. So pollen grains are the male sex cells. And then, you know, when they go inside and unite with the ovule that is present inside the ovary, and this fusion gives rise to a zygote inside the ovary. So this is the style. You can see how it is entering inside uh, this pollen. I mean, the passage from which the pollen enters and reaches the ovary. Uh, and... Uh, the plant having flowers, male reproductive cells of stamens of the flower, they fertilize and the female reproductive cells of the carpels of the same flower is called self-pollination. As I told you, if within the same flower, if this pollination takes place, the same uh, pollen grain of this, uh, the anther of that flower enters into the ovary of the same flower, then we call it as self-pollination because the uh, otherwise if it falls on some other flower or some other part of the uh, to some other uh, flower of a plant then we call it as a cross-pollination so you see self-pollination occurring in this datura plant And now the plants having flowers, that is male reproductive cells of the stamen of the flower, fertilize the female reproductive cells of the carpels of the same flower. So we call it as self-pollination. And male cells of the flower of a plant fertilize with other female flowers of the same group. This type of pollination is called as self-pollination because of the same flower it is happening. Now let us observe how are pollen, what are pollen grains. So we can, there is an activity where you can take a slide on which you can uh, put some pollen inside the anther, a powdery substance is present that is called as the pollen grains. You can put it on the slide and observe it under the microscope. Uh, you can take any flower, hibiscus, tridax, marigold, and uh, uh, put a drop of water on the slide and then observe it. Then we'll see the small dot-like structures in the water. And these dot-like structures are nothing but the pollen grains. Now you can even make a permanent slide and we can see it under a microscope to have a clear picture of what all are the different parts of a pollen grain. 
so uh, you can even make a drawing that is already available these drawing pictures are available in your textbook and then you can compare both what you are observing under the microscope and a diagram that you have drawn from the textbook So, uh, so what all are your observations? Your observations are this pollen grain consists of two or three cells surrounding by a protective wall in angiosperms. So in angiosperms, uh, what happens is, well, I told you to find out what are angiosperms and gymnosperms. So in angiosperms, what do you see? There are a protective walls that are surrounding Pollen grains consist of, you know, three layers in angiosperms, right? So these three layers, this, this is very important uh, when you differentiate between angiosperms and gymnosperms. These three walls of the pollen grains uh, surround, uh, surrounding these angiosperms are the protective walls across the pollen grain. And in gymnosperms, the pollen grain consists of several leaving cells. Okay, this is the major difference between angiosperms and gymnosperms. And looking at the structure of the ovule, the given diagram in the structure of the ovule presents the ovary of a plant. You can just see how this ovule, which is an X-shaped ovule, this is called as an ovule, and it is attached to the stalk of in the inner wall of the ovary. This is the stack. You can see all the way the ovary is, ovule, and the stack. And depending upon the species of the plants involved, a ovary may have one, two, several, or hundreds of ovules. It depends upon the flower. And at the center of each ovule is a microscopic embryo sac filled with food and water. As you see the, uh, you know, even the embryo inside which the baby, you know, umbilical cord, how the food is supplied. And we have got the layers around uh, the uh, uterus, which is filled with the nutrition that a baby gets. So similarly in plants also, this embryo sac is filled with the food and water material. And the embryo sac is composed of uh, gamoph uh, gametophytes. <coughs> and then the majority of the flowering plants have an embryo sac consisting of seven cells and eight nuclei. Uh, singular is nucleus and plural is nuclei. So since there are seven cells and eight nuclei in it, most of them inside the embryo sac, you'll find uh, there are around seven cells and uh, eight nuclei, okay? Otherwise, each cell should have one nucleus, but there are seven cells and eight nuclei. This is a point to be remembered. And they, they are one eggs, two synergids, one central cell and three antipodals. So what all are the parts of this uh, ovules you can see? Uh, you can see that the egg, this one is the center one is the egg. And uh, these other two are called synergids. And then you have got one central um, central nuclei and uh, polar nuclei. There are two nuclei here. And then these are called the antipodals. So what do you see is there are eight uh, nuclei that are present here. And then you even see that now let us see how fertilization, how does, uh, when, uh, what happens when this pollen grain enters into the inside and uh, uh, through the stigma. 
And then what happens to the pollen grains once it's entered through the stigma inside? And when the nucleus in each one of these cells divides, you have got the cell divisions, mitotic and meiotic division. And during sexual, meiotic division takes place only during sexual reproduction. So sex cells and no other part of the body. The other parts of the body will have only mitotic division. So here, this uh, when the, these cells divide to form two daughter nuclei, then the walls of the anther splits. Uh, anther inside which the pollen is stored. You have seen this structure into the datura plant earlier. You can even see it in the background. So the anther, it was covered by two parts that is called anther inside which you had a pollen grain. And when this anther splits, it opens and the pollen grains can be shed. And there are many ways this pollen is, um, you know, wind, water, and many external forces that helps this pollen to fall inside the stigma of a flower. And uh, this pollen, once it's shed, see this uh, diagram, see, you can see how this cross-pollination is taking place. These pollen grains are transferred, I told you, through wind, water, or certain times insects. Most of the time when the insect sits to suck the nectar from the flowers, uh, they have a sticky uh, on the legs, you know, pollen gets sticked. And from this flower, when they reach to some other flower, uh, they also, they are also responsible for transferring uh, this pollen to some other flower. So this is where is happening. This uh, These are responsible for cross-pollination. Cross-pollination cannot occur if wind, water, or insects are not there. Um, then, you know, mostly those flowers will go with self-pollination. Self because self-pollination may occur once this and so you can see how these insects are moving from one place to another place. And cells on the surface of the stigma secretes a sticky nutrient fluid that contains sugary substance. For that only the most of the insects goes there. And substances in which pollen grains germinate and produces a slender thin wall uh, pollen tube. Uh, a pollen tube is like, you know, like an umbilical cord is temporarily produced uh, inside the womb of, uh, of for a baby. Say, similarly, similarly, we even see a temporary during fertilization, a temporary pollen tube is produced. So you can see how through this stigma, the pollen grain is entering inside for fertilization. And now while this is going, it has made its own pollen tube. The passage is a bypass passage is made using this pollen tube. And this pollen tubes grows through the tissues of the stigma style ovary and enters into the interiors of the ovule through a small channel. You can just see it is very clearly shown in the picture how it is entering it with. And meanwhile, two nuclei of the pollen grains. We have seen that there are two nuclei of the pollen grain. Uh, that one of these divides again to form two sperms. So how the sperm cells are formed the, in this nuclei. And the center of the ovule is a microscopic embryo sort that consisting of the seven cells, three antipodals, one polar nuclear, two synergies, and one X cell, which we have seen. So, uh, this is how it enters. And you can see the central cells. These are the antipodals, polar nuclei, and synergies, and egg cell. So soon after the tip of the pollen tube, from the tip of the pollen tube and the pollen enters into the embryo sac, the end of the tube ruptures and releases two sperms inside the sac. And one of the two sperms fuses with the egg to form zygote, which will develop into an embryonic plant within the ovule. Within the ovule only we can see it. By the time the egg cell has been fertilized, the two polar nuclei have combined to form a single fusion nucleus, which unites with the second sperm to form the endosperm. So uh, there are two sperms that are formed. So one sperm is used for to fertilize and make a zygote, and the other sperm is for to make an endosperm.
So now the union of one sperm with the egg and the second sperm with the fusion of the nucleus. So this is called as double fertilization. When endosperm, you know, this uh, is also made. The ovule is covered by means of a layers. So this type of fertilization is called as a double fertilization. And it mostly forms in the flowering. This occurs only in flowering plants. Whereas double for non-flowering plants does not have the double fertilization because there is there are no angiosperms are the plants, flowering plants. And non-flowering plants doesn't have uh, to go with the double fertilization because there is no endosperm required there. Now, how does a seed germination takes place? So to see that, you know, this is a very good activity, which you can easily do it in your home. Uh, soak this Bengal gram in water for overnight and then drain the water and cover it uh, with this cloth and keep it in the sun for some time and keep sprinkling water at regular intervals so that these seeds does not dry up. And then open the seeds carefully to observe the parts. So you can, your observation can, uh, you can see that this seeds, embryo is developed into the seedling plumule, which grows into a plant. So from these seedlings only, you can just see how the, it has been germinated and new plant can develop from those seeds. So in 1852, a German scientist by name Robert Remick, he has published his observation that one cell division and stated that binary fission of the cells was the means of reproduction of animal cells. He was talking about the binary fission. In the binary fission, he wanted to say how equally all the contents of a uh, embryo is uh, separated, divided, giving rise to a daughter cell. So, this is how he has given his explanation uh, through a series of divisions that takes place, you know, when we are doing it, uh, mitotic divisions. In mitotic divisions, what do we see? We see that uh, where there are different phases, four phases of divisions. And finally, they give rise to a germ cells. So what happened was this was uh, very widely when Robert Rimmick made this, this was very widely publicized by Rodolf Virchow, who gave the phrase omnicellulate cellula. This is a Latin word which means all cells from cells. So this has these cells, there are many cells due to the mitotic divisions that has formed and uh, they gave rise to other cells. So then Rodolf Wurcher, this was, uh, has given this, that all cells, this is Rodolf Wurcher, you can see, all cells from the cells was given by him. Then he has shown how do these cells divide, you know, one cell divides into two daughter uh, cells, and then this, this, each individual is again dividing into two, and then that's how, you know, uh, from one uh, cell as divided into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight daughter nuclei. So how does this cell division takes place? What are the different stages in this mitotic and meiotic division was well explained uh, by him. Then Welder Fleming reported that there were a string-like structure. He has said that there are some string-like structures which splits longitudinally. If you can just see in during the anaphase, metaphase and anaphase, these strings. But uh, well, Fleming could not explain what these strings are, but he did observe that there are some strings inside the nucleus that is longitudinally dividing during the cell division. That is the anaphase. You see a spindle-like metaphase, a spindle-like structure is formed and then these thread-like structures are getting separated longitudinally. So this was observed by Fleming 
And uh, then he has sh shown that, explained that how these thread-like structures uh, form a spindle and get separated into two daughter nuclei, daughter cells. And uh, the, what are these threads? Then rocks, Wellman rocks proposed that each chromosome carried different sets of heredit hereditary elements and suggested that the longitudinal splitting is observed by uh, Fleming is ensured. So even uh, Wilman Rocks has also observed as uh, Fleming said that there is some longitudinal division. Even he ensured that yes, Fleming was right. Even he has observed the same thing. And uh, both of them were thinking that this thread-like structure has something to do with the hereditary characteristics. Uh, to carry this uh, hereditary like parent and uh, offsprings, uh, the similarities in the parent and offsprings that we see are because of this. Then, you know, Mendel has done his Mendel gets a uh, uh, next chapter, we'll be seeing the hereditary characteristics and Mendel has done a great uh, research and experiments on the pea plants and uh, and he has shown in 1866 in his paper that how hereditary characters are um, you know transfer hereditary characters are transferred from parent to uh, offsprings in the pea plants so Grigor Mendel's hereditary um, uh, discovery on hereditary and how this, what is the central role of uh, chromosomes in carrying the hereditary material and the genetic material as well along with them was very clearly explained, which we are going to, it's very interesting. We are going to have it in the next uh, class. And then Bauer has the chemical nature of the, has explained about the chemical nature of the genetic material, which was determined in the series of experiments over the next 50 years it took for them. Then the, what is the structure of DNA? Finally, Watson and Crick in 1953 could give us the clear picture of DNA and its structures. And how does this cell division takes place in human being? If you look at the mitotic divisions, how are they transformed uh, from a human fertilized egg into a baby, a nine month baby into an adult for next 20 years were so well explained by Crick and Watson. And then the bone, bone marrow cells actively divides by mitosis to produce red blood cells. And mitosis helps in replacing it. You can just see mitotic division is very important everywhere. And until and unless it doesn't take place, the blood cells cannot multiply. And how this mitotic division helps in the wounding of the heel. Uh, if this cannot take place, you know, uh, wound healing may not happen. So the cell ha cells have to divide through the mitotic, multiply through mitotic division. Because of this multiplication, there are so many things that are happening. And in contrast, cancer cells do not respond to such growth regulating factors and continuous dividing at the expense of normal cells thus ultimately killing the host. So that is what, but what is happening among the normal cells is whenever it is, when there is an injury, you can see that the uh, cells multiply by the mitotic as per the requirement, they multiply and you know, they give rise to uh, this mitotic division give rise to many cells to help you protect you from bleeding. But whereas in a cancer patient, it's not responding to the, uh, the cells are not aware of uh, the body requirement and they keep on multiplying. And uh, ultimately this kills the host cell. And that is how the abnormalities and other functionalities that happens in the body. So uh, let us see how this meiotic, so it's become important to understand the process involved in the cell. Cell division is very important. How does a male cell and a female cell, they combine together to form a meiosis. Uh, in meiosis, 
and why a meiosis is also called as a reduction division and fertilization takes place. And you can see that how the chromosomes of the male and female are dividing into two and ultimately through to within 40 to 60 minutes, you know, this all is happening inside our body within 40 to 60 minutes. There are so many cell divisions and so many cells, the dead cells are thrown out and the new cells are made inside our body. And this period with the two cells divisions is called as an interface. It is between 40 to 60 minutes period is called as an interface period. And this is an actual period when genetic material makes its copy so that it's equally distributed among the daughter cells called mitosis. So in this, in mitotic division, this is what is happening. So if you look at the mitotic phase, what happened? There are different phases. In G1 phase, what do you see? The DNA synthesizes between the completion of mitosis and beginning of the DNA to replication. Takes place. And uh, the, the DNA starts replicating and making Two. And in the S phase, what is happening? This period of DNA synthesizes chromosomes forming sister chromatids. And in G2 phase, the DNA replication and beginning of mitosis takes place. And uh, in M phase, this mitotic cell division phase, what is happening is, uh, you know, uh, the mitotic cell division phase takes place and the number of nuclei and this is a cell cycle. So first three phases of the cell cycle is collectively, this cell cycle is called as an interface. Then when we observe the different stages of mitotic division, there are four phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So what happens in this four, we have to observe uh, clearly, I mean, observe and see how the cell division takes place in mitosis. So in first prophase stage, what is happening in the prophase stages, chromosomes contract you know, contraction of the chromosomes takes place. They are thread-like structures. They contract into thick structures and becomes spiral in shape. And they have become visible under light microscope. And nuclei become smaller. Nucleoli, inside the nucleus, you have got nucleoli. And the size of the nucleoli becomes smaller because all the material has been taken by the thread. Like earlier, it were, they were so uh, uh, thread-like invisible structures, but once they become thick, you will be able to observe it and observe them under the microscope. So this is what happens in the first stage of the prophase stage, where this thread-like chromosomes becomes thicker enough and the nuclei size reduces. And then what else happens in prophase stages? Chromosomes, they split lengthwise to form a chromatid connected by a centromere. You have seen that a chromatid, you know, in the center of the, uh, there is a, a centromere is there through which they are connected. There are four uh, structures, like, let me, if I can draw and show you here. So you can see these thread-like structures that in, in the center, it is a centromere. They get connected and that's how they get divided. So these chromosomes, they split to form chromatids and these are chromatids and they are connected by a centromere. In the center, you will see a, a centromere here. So somewhere in between here, you can see a centromere. So this chromatics gets connected through it.
Now, the next stage, what happens? The nuclear membrane, the nucleus, which is covered by a membrane, is it a membrane breaks down. And the cent uh, centrosome containing rod like centrioles divides and forms spindle. Uh, and it mostly happens in the animal cells and no pairing of chromosomes as in meiosis. In meiosis, these uh, chromosomes, you know, they pair with the opposite, like male and female, it happens in meiosis. Whereas in mitosis, no pairing takes place. This is the difference between mitotic and meiotic. You, you will even have the differences between mitotic and meiotic division. So you have to remember this. Pairing takes place only in meiotic division, not in mitotic division. In mitosis, it is not happening. So these are the four um, steps that happens in prophase. And then let us say what happens in metaphase. When you are uh, when you are going through this video, make sure that you open your textbooks and look at the diagrams. And then when you try to understand it, it will become easy for you to understand. So the second stage of mitotic division is the metaphase. In metaphase, the uh, chromosomes that are formed in prophase stage move to a spindle-like equator in the centrosome attached to the spindle fibers. And centromeres split separating the chromatids. And then the third stage is the anaphase. And these spindle fibers attached to centromeres, they contract pulling chromatids towards the poles. Okay. And now the last stage is the telophase. In telophase, the chromatids elongate and become invisible. And replication of this stage to become a chromosome. And the second is nuclear membranes form around daughter nuclei. And cell membranes pinches in to form daughter cells or new cell wall material becomes laid down across spindle equator and plants. Uh, so this telophase, uh, you can see that it's clear division of the two cells and the side of the cytoplasm stars. And now let us see what happens in meiosis. In meiosis, you know, uh, uh, the continuous process of cell division in most of the cells takes place and it occurs only during the formation of the sexual reproduction, during the gametes in the sexual reproduction. Only there meiosis takes place. And it has got two phases. And during the first phase of meiosis, the parent cells divides twice through the cent uh, chromosomes and it divides only once. And then second phase of meiosis is similar to the normal mitosis, but chromosomes do not duplicate over, uh, over the chromosomes. And they are equally dis, uh, distributed between each cells. And then the four daughter cells have just uh, formed and number of, half the number of the parent cell, these are haploid. Whereas in mitosis, we saw that eight, cell, eight cells are formed. Thus, this division is also called as a reduction division, but it's completely half of it. And this is very important for you all to understand what is the reproductive health. Uh, AIDS is one of the very, very, uh, I mean, dangerous disease. Uh, and December 1st is, uh, you know, is a celebrate, I should not say it's celebrated, it's a day did not it to make great awareness, spread awareness about the AIDS. It's an international AIDS case and the full form of AIDS is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. These diseases spray, spread by unsafe sexual contacts and using infective devices. You don't know if you are using this most of the time when you go to a barber shop or anywhere. That is what hygiene and cleaning is very important. And some infected person has used it. And even you have used these, any of these items that are infected. And most of the time in the hospitals also, if the if it is not being properly, hygiene is not maint, maintained properly, either in hospitals or in the barber shops, there are chances of this uh, infected uh, you know, uh, needles or uh, infected instruments that are used to an infected person may get transformed into your blood and through blood, this disease can be 
transferred and uh, at certain times you know this also has become very unsafe when an infected person's blood was without checking the hiv uh, for aids you know if that blood is transferred into a normal patient then also we have seen many people suffering and andhra pradesh has the highest number of hiv patients in the country uh, whatever so maybe the conditions of that place but there are 5 lakhs of 24 lakhs hiv positive patients in the country were found during 2011 and 12 and the highest number that is 5 lakhs were found only in andhra pradesh while one in every 300 adults one among were suffering from hiv elsewhere in andhra pradesh and every 100 adults in hiv patient that is almost 1% so uh, whereas throughout india we are finding to, if you look at the statistics throughout india one person out of 300 are hiv positive and whereas in andhra one out of 100 only are hiv this is three times more uh, when compared to the country's statistics of hiv in andhra pradesh so uh, and the prevalence of hiv is 1.07% among males and 0.73 among females in the state which is against this highest in the other states it's very high when compared to other states in andhra pradesh and now what are the main factors that are contributing uh, to hiv is one is illiteracy and because people are not literate they don't know if you are literate educated then only you will maintain hygiene uh, poor health condition unemployment migration non traditional sex practices and trafficking uh, these are some of the very bad practices that we see uh, which is happening because of unemployment you know this trafficking this type of um, uh, people earning money out of such uh, has become very common and this is leading to uh, aids disease and uh, anti retroviral therapy to supply medicines to hiv patients have been started and asha red ribbons express etc are there to create the awareness in the society and the risk and symptoms of the aids so uh, this is an acute uh, hiv infection cases and which may happen because of all these negligences hygiene is very important and whenever you are going to an hospital make sure that uh, disposable syringes and all those things are used and if at all there is a need for a blood transfusion whether it is uh, been done properly or not is very important so this ends your chapter and then i want you all to go through it so that we can discuss it in the classroom if you have got any doubts and do with that so see you all in the next class